Hello and welcome to our Meet the Makers event for Crossings on Doc World, a film by Emmy Award winning director Diane Borche Liam, commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Korean Armistice Agreement. Thank you for turning in for the conversation. I'm Andia Winslow, your host of Doc World. Our panelists include today Emmy Award winning director Diane Borche Liam, Christine Ahn, peace activist and founder and executive director of Women Cross DMZ, A Young Choi, civic activist and chair of the board of directors of Women Cross DMZ. Women Cross DMZ is a global movement of women, Nobel Peace Laureates, peace and human rights activists, female leaders and artists mobilizing to end the war in Korea and ensure women's leadership in peace building. In 2015, 30 international women peacemakers led the efforts to cross the demilitarized zone or DMZ from North Korea to South Korea. They walked with 10,000 Korean women on both sides of the DMZ, North and South, and held a women's peace symposium in Pyongyang and Seoul. Before we get started with our discussion, here's the film's trailer. My family grew up literally taught that North Koreans were devils with red horns. Peacemakers, all women from around the world, set out to walk across the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. We really feel an obligation as women to try to uh, stop wars. We really appreciate those foreign women from all over the world taking concern about these problems. Building peace is about taking risks. So for me, I think this is one step we should really take. The journey may or may not be permitted. To be a Panmunjom on the northern side and look over into the south and to not be able to simply walk across the line to the southern side it was quite frustrating. It just highlighted the absurdity of this division. And it could be dangerous. What are we doing that is so threatening, you know? And the way that they're framing it and casting it is that we are the violators of human rights. The worst case scenario is violence. When you do this kind of work, you do it because you believe that something has to shift. Felt like the stars were finally aligned. That real peace could actually happen. Crossings on Doc World. Watch on World Channel and in the PBS app. Thank you all for joining us for this panel discussion today. I want to start with you, Deanne. First of all, thank you so much for showing this documentary on World and Doc World. What was the impetus for making this film? You're a pro prolific filmmaker, but why now and why this film? I was born in South Korea, and um, at the age of eight, I was adopted by an American family and grew up in California. And um, partly because of the trauma of being separated at the age of eight from my original family, I developed amnesia about Korea and um, basically forgot everything, forgot the language, forgot my name, everything. And it wasn't until years later that I started to recall um, recollections of my family and eventually learned that um, I did have a birth family in Korea and was reunited with them. And over the course of um, working on um, many different film projects and research, I learned that my separation from my original family in Korea um, occurred in the context of war and national division, and that my desire as a young person to um, search for and meet my Korean family mirrored the, the ardent desire of millions of Korean family members who've been divided um, because of the unended war and because of the, the DMZ and the ongoing separation. This war is often referred to as the Forgotten War. Mm -hmm. um, even though some four million people were killed, um, among them about three million Koreans, a majority of them civilians. And, um, and also over 30,000 US troops were killed. Mm -hmm. In the United States, people don't realize that the war never ended. Um, mm -hmm. Fighting stopped in 1953 with the signing of an armistice, but actually a peace treaty was never signed. So, and right. the fact that this war never ended actually goes to the heart of the existing tensions between the US and North Korea. You know, I think it's really important to bring this end, bring this war to a formal end and um, bring permanent peace to Korea. Christine Ahn, um, actually, you know, we met in Berkeley, California many years ago, and one day she contacted me and asked me that, um, whether I wanted to go to Korea for um, 
this peace walk that involved a group of women uh, advocating for a formal end to the Korean War and the uh, reunion of divided family members. And I thought it was um, a, an amazing idea, a very unique, creative idea um, that could shed a you know different light on this historic conflict. And um, so I immediately agreed. And um, I also at the same time decided that I, I wanted to film it because I, you know you don't cross the DMZ every day. And I knew that it would be an historic event. This summer, which is the 70th anniversary of that ceasefire where American, North Korean and Chinese commanders signed the armistice where they actually committed within 90 days to return to negotiate a permanent peace settlement that has never happened. And mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to do is trying to center the experiences of families, of millions of divided families, of the people of North Korea who are still impacted by this unresolved war, whether it's in the form of sanctions or the 80 million people living on the Korean Peninsula that uh, have to live under the constant threat of war. And I think this is the power of women, power of women organizing, is we know that when women are involved in peace processes, whether it's organizing on the streets, organizing peace walks across the DMZ, educational symposiums, um, doing media, uh, writing op-eds, organizing our communities, multi-generational communities, that we can bring an end to war. And this is the longest standing U.S. conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and most Americans have no idea that this war is right. still going on, that the United States divided the peninsula. The United States is an active combatant in this war, and Americans mm -hmm. have no idea. And so we have actually a bill called uh, the Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act, it's uh, House Resolution 1369. And I think what this film also shows, and it kind of ends, you know, before we actually get to Washington, D.C., but it shows that people power matters, that when we right. organize, we can actually make change. We can make change. I want to talk to you, Ayang, about your experience filming this, being in the in the crowd and the 30 women who were the the uh, leaders of this walk and how that felt. What was the experience like? I guess in one word, it was life changing for me. And it was just like a dream come true for me. And it, in fact, as Diane said, uh, the genesis for all of this in my in my life uh, was um, the dream that my mother and father had. So we, our family left Korea. I was, I was actually born in what is today North Korea. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was just three years old, we moved out of Korea. It was under Japanese occupation. So when I heard about this trip, I, I was so ecstatic. And I was so happy to meet all these women who actually we had not met before. Many of us just mm -hmm. converged in Beijing. That was our first night, first dinner together. And some of us had emailed each other and gotten to know each other. But we were just like so, so happy to meet. And there was this immediate bonding. I was going to ask Christine and Deanne, how did you select the 30 uh, participants in the in the walk? Well, I would say that it began with um, first with Gloria Steinem. I first contacted Gloria because I knew she was obviously uh, a high profile feminist and somebody that could help us um, open doors and help us, you know, garner the, the attention that this kind of action deserved. And I mm -hmm. emailed her and within moments, she actually quickly responded back and she said, wow. I would love to, um, I would love to, uh, you know, I lost several classmates in the Korean war. And if I could do my small part to bring an end to this war and healing, I will. And so we just started to brainstorm and I really wanted not just um, American women because of the importance of the United States, but also women that you know are from countries that participated in the war. Most people have no idea that it was you know 21 countries participated in the war, um, many on the U.S. the U.N. command side, and so I wanted to include you know Australia and Canada and Mexico mm -hmm. and you know uh, the U.K. Um, just so that there is this kind of collective sense of responsibility, that right. it wasn't just a war between North and South Korea, but that it actually is an international conflict and that 
we all have a responsibility to help bring closure to this war. Right. I'm, I'm curious, you, you parallel the 1951 delegation of women, international women who went to, um, to North Korea to, to take a look at what happens to women and children in war. And now we have you all doing it in 2015 years later. Um, what was the most remarkable thing that you experienced? I think it's, it's hard not to get emotional watching some of the women discuss the horrors of war they experienced, but um, was there anything in particular that anyone said to you that really just, just stuck, stuck with you and made you want to continue doing the work that you're doing? Hearing the testament, testimonies of the women survivors of, of the Korean War in North Korea was um, just really poignant. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very rare for Americans to hear um, anything, actually. I mean, about the war from the North Korean perspective. And North Korea was just, you know, bombed completely, flattened during the war. Um, and so to hear the women's experience and what they went through, you know, people who lost fathers, mothers, siblings. Um, there was a medical worker who helped napalm vic victims. Uh, mm -hmm. A woman who was a seven-year-old seven girl lost her hands. Um, I think their um, testimonies really put a human face on the impact of this war, which, you know, continues to be seen here as forgotten. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think for the international delegates, you know, to hear, um, to hear this and to kind of, um, I think, just, it, I think it just humanized this experience and humanized this war, which in some ways can be very abstract. Mm -hmm. um, and um, to hear it from a people, from a group of people that are considered the enemy, um, I think that really started to shift people's perspectives. And then also for the North Korean women, I think to be heard by mm -hmm. Americans and these international delegates, and to be listened to, um, I think that also was uh, an important and um, poignant experience as well. I've got a question about that. Your interview subjects and the folks that you featured in the film, have they been able to see the film since its completion? In the North or? In the, no in the North or? In, and, in and the North, the they have. They haven't. Yes, um, in the South, in the North, they have not. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a travel ban currently in place that was put in place during the Trump years that has not been lifted. And um, so Americans who used to be able to travel to North Korea can no longer do so, um, including family members who have American family members who have family in the North. I think what's also very interesting is the nuance of you all leading a peace effort and yet being maligned as trouble, trouble starters, rebel rousers. How has that opinion of you in that country changed after the successful screenings in South Korea? That's a great question. I mean, you know, I feel like all of the women were so incredibly courageous to take on the stuff that came at them, you know. Um, it's part of the the red baiting and kind of the McCarthyism that actually is now now rising um, in the United States um, with current tensions with China. And I, I think we're gonna, we continue to see increase um, anti-Asian and um, kind of the red baiting that we've seen before in the past. I, I, I feel like, I, I feel a lot of respect for the women, for Christine um, in particular, who, you know, went through just hell <laughs> to make this happen. <laughs> Was it all worth it, even though you were attacked and threatened and all those things? Of course it's worth it. I mean, of course, anything, any small step we can take right, to bring closure to a war that has separated a Korean people mm. for so, for four generations. I mean, it's so tragic. You know, my, my mother, um, you know, she, she passed away before I, I did the crossing, but, um, you know, my first trip to North Korea was in 2004. And, you know, I really, uh, it was during the whole axis of evil. And we really thought that North Korea could be bombed, you know, after Iraq. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember like sitting with her and asking her, should I go to North Korea? And she, you know, this is somebody who was born during the Japanese occupation. She, you know, grew up like not being able to, uh, she had to take a Japanese name. She had to wear kimonos. She had mm. to, you know, they couldn't have Korean newspapers and she had to speak Japanese in the, in the schools. So, you know, for her to say to me, 
um, we are one country, we are mm -hmm. one people, um, and you should see the other half of our homeland. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, of course, I mean, as a Korean American and as somebody who knows now this critical history and has just seen the devastating consequences mm -hmm. of this unresolved war, not just on the North Korean people's lives, but also in South Korea, and also, mm -hmm. you know, generations of Korean Americans who have been working for peace and who have been red baited and maligned. I mean, you know, this is this is what struggle is. And just like mm -hmm. the civil rights movement, just like the courageous women's rights movement, this is progress. This is evolution. There's always mm -hmm. going to be a step back, but we have to keep going forward. And that's just been the beautiful thing of of doing this work with women is we protect each other. We uh, we thread together. We know so and so and so and so. And you know, it's um, it's a beautiful tapestry of a movement. And I think you know, it's not just about um, bringing an end to this war, but it's about the healing and it's about the mm -hmm. reconciliation. And you know, one of the screenings that we did in New York City, Abigail Disney, who is in the film, you know, she's Disney. You know, she's part of the Disney family. And um, the Moderator Anna Oliveira asked her, "What is it like to be at Disney going into a place like North Korea?" And I mm. loved her response. She said, um, "If my last name represents mainstream America, then I was so proud and happy that I could go and listen to the North Korean women. You know, mm -hmm. that is the first step in reconciliation and healing. Right. And so I think this film is a real gift to not just." peace on the Korean Peninsula, but I think for Americans to understand the legacy of our country in a place like Korea. It was really eye-opening to see and hear from actual citizens, uh, women especially. Um, so that was really a great takeaway um, for me. I'm, I'm curious uh, for all of you, reunification is something that we have no idea if and when it will happen, but a lot of people who were who were born or young when, when the war first started and the conflict first started are aging out. So we, they may not ever be re reunified with their families. Who are the, remain, the remaining um, cohort and how old would they be so audiences can understand how, how little time is left for them to actually meet and see their family once again? I left Korea, Korea when I was three years old and that was 1943. There's very little time left for mm -hmm. at least two generations of Koreans who endured, survived the war, in and in many forms survived and and died in other other forms. Um, so it's getting really urgent. There are just a very few people, few left, who are still eager to try to make it there, if possible, mm -hmm. for reunions, but are physically uh, ill, too too old mm -hmm. and too weak to make the trip. So they they're beginning to give up. You know, of the millions of um, families that have been divided since um, the end of the war, um, there have only been about 20,000 people who have taken part in 21 family reunions, rounds of family reunions that have taken place between North and South Korea since 1985. And um, the last round of North-South uh, reunions took place um, in 2018, which is briefly seen um, in in the film, and I recall, you know, reading at that time that um, the reports um, coming out of Korea was that um, there were 56,000 South Koreans, the vast majority of them who were in their 80s and 90s, that were waiting to be chosen by lottery for the next round of reunions. Um, wow. And of course, the, that the next round of reun reunions has not happened. Um, so, you know, those and those who are selected for those reunions maybe spend 10, 12 hours over two or three days with their families. Wow. And then after saying goodbye, they literally have no hope of ever seeing them again. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's one of the ongoing tragedies of this conflict. Um, and, you know, just to add that in the United States, there are an estimated 100,000 or so um, Koreans who have families in the North um, who also, you know, right now can cannot see their families. So, and I think this has in repercussions over generations, um, mm -hmm. this um, tragedy of just, you know, not being able to see the fa your family across the border and having to also see them as the enemy 
um, mm -hmm. and to kind of forsake them as the enemy. I think that creates um, a kind of moral injury that here are our family members that we have to deny and mm -hmm. name as the enemy. It, it's, yeah, it's part of this ongoing tragedy that we have to bring to an end. We have a chance to transform the longest standing U.S. conflict, you know, and I think it's it's the one that is could be the most dangerous in terms of the threat of nuclear war or the one that has the greatest possibility to transform, um, mm -hmm. you know, the situation, especially between the U.S. and China. And so it just seems to me that the the path is clear. It is time to fulfill our our promise and negotiate a, a peace agreement. And I think that that will be the path that could then do so many things, whether it's help families reunite, these elderly people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s that will soon pass without seeing their loved ones. Our, our main task really is the education of the general American public. And mm -hmm. we try to do it in various ways small group meetings you know at community centers showing the film it's, it's very inspirational but we have a very heavy lobbying uh, or advocacy agenda which is to communicate with our elected officials that is the way that we have been able to get up to 50 sponsors of the Korea, peace on the korean peninsula act that christine mentioned thank you well uh, deanne Christine A. Young, thank you so much for sharing your stories, your expertise, your passion for this issue, the 70th anniversary of the armistice in Korea. If you want to learn more, you can find us online. You can check out World on social, on YouTube, and subscribe to our newsletter as well. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening.